uh, another one that ended up on the rhinestone record, my highway song. Um, but I was under a, I was hiking in a kind of a, a little more obscure part of the park in a place called the Colonel Charles Young Grove. And most of the big sequoias at the Sequoia National Park are named after, ironically, Civil War generals or um, Gilded Age politicians. None of them care about the sequoias, <laughs> ironically. But anyway, there I was under this magnificent, I mean, this tree was, it was easily as big as, as, as the stage is. It was huge. And, you know, 300 feet tall was huge. I wondered, like, what's the deal with Colonel Charles Young? Because I'm a historian myself. I actually have a minor, I, you know, graduated from college with a minor in history. Um, and I've written and studied history all my life. Um, but I didn't know about Colonel Young, so I was reading the little plaques and stuff, and, and it turned out that Young was, was the first African American to graduate from West Point in the 19th century. And he did this, this was an amazing accomplishment. And you think he would have been, got a lot of support, but he didn't. I mean, the instructors and his fellow, his fellow uh, classmates did everything they could to get him to fail. Um, really awful stuff. But he got through it. He graduated from West Point. He was in the United States officer, the first one to graduate. Then he became an exemplary soldier. He was, he was a really, truly was a great American. And the soldiers who served under him, both black and white, you know, re really revered him. He was, he never ordered guys to do things. He, he led. That's what he did. He was the first one. And, um, so, Young ended his career at Sequoia National Park right before he retired. He retired a full colonel. He would have been a general, probably at least a brigadier, brigadier general, had he been one. He was a brilliant soldier. But anyway, as it was, he, he was a colonel. So they made him commandant of the park. In those days, the United States Army ran the parks. And uh, Sequoia National Park in the late 1890s and early 2000s, um, in the late 1890s, early 1900s, was in danger of not being a park at all. It was just being overrun with, with these, these poachers who were cutting down the, the sequoia groves and then hauling the trees away and making a killing, making just ungodly money to do this. So Young knew he had to stop that. He only had a few soldiers under his command, and most of these guys were terrified of these, of these poachers. They were armed. There's a lot of them. They'd come in with gangs of 20 or 30 guys into the park and just intimidate everybody and no one would stop them. So Young, you know, his first, his sort of first uh, goal, I have to say the Sequoias, from being cut down, what, we don't have a park. So, you know, like, well, like I said earlier, he didn't order guys to do stuff. He did, you know, he led. So a few times early in his stay there, when these gangs would come on to the park, you know, carrying their saws and their guns and their chet knives and their chains. And he'd, they'd be coming down the main road. And Young would sort of step out of the bushes and he'd stand in the way of, these, of the road. And he'd yell at them to cease and desist, turn around, go home, there won't be any trouble, just go home. Forget this idea, go home. I mean business. So, of course, these guys, they would yell at him, call him all the names. You know, they, they yelled at him, they were gonna string him up, of course. And Young yelled back at him, yeah, you may string me up, that's true. Then he sort of pulled open his coat, and he had two Colt 45s on his belt. And he said, but which one of you wants to make the first step? <laughs> so, of course, they backed down from that kind of courage. Young saved the park. So there I was, you know, like underneath the Colonel Charles Young tree, you know, one of the great Americans of the Gilded Age. And I was like, I have to write a song right now about this experience. So I sort of, I know, not to be corny about this, but yeah, I, I prayed. I prayed to God to give me a good idea, a good solid idea. It's not corny, we love to pray. That's right. 
so interestingly, I, the idea was not, you know, a catchy title about Colonel Charles Young or about the Sequoias or about the mountains. What popped into my mind was very clearly write a song about the Ramones. <laughs> The greatest American rock and roll band in history, yes. But the Ramones, they were an urban rock and roll band. Why in the world did God tell me to write a song about the Ramones underneath this beautiful natural area? Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? But it, it worked. I mean, the song just started taking form really quickly. I sort of took the angle that um, it, early in the score, Jason the Scorcher's career in 82, we did a tour uh, all through Texas, opening for the Ramones. And in 1982, man, it was crazy. I mean, they were crazy good. It was fantastic good. But also their audiences were really, I mean, in Texas they had this sort of game they played whereby they would bring all kinds of really vile stuff to the show to throw at the opening band. We didn't have any idea this was getting ready to happen. We had no idea. We were kind of curious as to, okay, why why did we get this opening gig to start with? We were unknown at the time. But I think in retrospect, no one in Texas really wanted the gig. <laughs> you know? Wow, you know, before we even hit a single note, I would walk on stage with my cowboy hat and my fringe shirt, and it was like an avalanche of garbage was thrown at us. It was like a World War I artillery barrage, barrage of garbage. <laughs> yes. you know, we were buried in it, but we, by God, we kept on playing. We held our ground. So this song came out of that. 